All right, today's lecture is on Napoleon, the rise of Napoleon, the first step from his birth until his seizure of power. So we're picking up here the rise of Napoleon. We're going to go from uh, his birth in 1769 until he takes over France in 1799, about the age of 30. So here we go, Napoleon Bonaparte, or uh, in his youth, he would have been Napoleone Buonaparte, the very Italian. In fact, uh, he's a Frenchman by just one year. France bought the island of Corsica in 1768, and he was born in 1769. So he's just barely a Frenchman, and he does not grow up wanting to be a Frenchman. He wants to be a, a Corsican rebel. He is born into a minor noble family. They are influential on the island of Corsica. But uh, one of the things you want to look at when you study Napoleon or look at Napoleon and his personality, we try to understand him, is I believe he's very Italian. If you think of Italian stereotypes, I think uh, it's better to understand the way his behavior he comes from a big family, very dedicated to his mother, and um, he is not the first son. He is the second son, so he grows up with a bit of a chip on his shoulder. His older brother is very passive, Joseph, and Napoleon is very aggressive. Um, he has a big family, younger brothers, younger sisters, and uh, he grows up on the island of Corsica here. Corsica is off the Italian coast, but France just bought it, and so he is technically a Frenchman, although he does not want to be. Um, Corsica today is a paradise island, a vacation resort island. Not at that time, it actually was kind of poor. Um, so he's not the wealthiest person around, but on the island his family is influential. He is sent to France to military school. That's where he'll spend the first 20 years of his life learning to be a, a military man or uh, from the age of nine on, the first stage of his life in France, away from his family, studying military. And during the French Revolution, when the French Revolution breaks out, he's in the French army. And then 1793, there's a civil war, the terror, the year of the terror. He had become a Jacobin in the army and is sent to the city of Toulon. The city of Toulon had risen up against the, um, the, the Committee of Public Safety. And so he was part of the committee's government, the French government, to reclaim the city of Toulon. This is an important naval base. When he helped do it, he played a significant role setting the artillery there. And uh, when he did it, he went from the rank of captain to general in one battle. Again, you can do this. The French Revolution opened up fields to merit, and the warfare opened it up to quick rises. And he becomes general almost overnight. 1794, when the um, Committee of Public Safety fell, he actually went to prison for a while. And then 1795, he's back in action in what is called the whiff of grape shot. What happened here is in the year 1795, the new, direct, the new government is called the Directory, and again, extremely corrupt, and uh, he, it gets attacked from both sides. The left and the right attack this new government, and he is there when there's a royalist coup. It's in October 1795, a royalist coup. This is a coup from the right. They want to bring back a king. And he is going to set the cannons in the city of Paris and fire into the mobs as these Royalists are trying to take over the government. He will have no problem firing on them at close range with cannons. Not firing cannonballs, but firing what are called what's called grape shot. This is a canister full of small metal balls. Fire them down a street into a crowd and you'll kill hundreds. And he had no problem doing this, no qualms about this at all. Again, we really don't think he's much of a Frenchman at this point. He's just a guy who wants to be part of things. So here he is in the streets of Paris killing people. Well, this kind of makes him um, liked by some and hated by others. Napoleon Bonaparte becomes a hero of this directory government, a hero of the Republic. He has saved the Republic. He becomes the toast of Paris. He, had, he was kind of a loner in his youth. He didn't speak French very well. He wanted to be a Corsican instead of a Frenchman. But now he's the toast of Paris. He begins to feel himself a little more French now. He goes to parties, high society. This was not his life at all. He's not very social necessarily. He uh, begins to get money. One of the directors is a guy named Barra, and he begins to give Napoleon money uh, to run the army for him and protect the government. And it's at one of these parties that he meets Josephine Beauharnais. Her story is one of uh, the French Revolution. She's from the island of Martinique. Her family were sugar plantation owners. She goes back to France to marry a nobleman. And in the terror, her husband was killed, and she is left to raise two children. Again, she has no means to do this, and so she gets by any way she can. She goes to high society parties and gets with various men who give her money, support her, 
and she's always on the lookout for a new sugar daddy. And here comes Napoleon Bonaparte. He is smitten with her, and um, he's an up-and-coming guy. In fact, uh, Barah was the guy she was with, kind of sends her over to Napoleon. And again, he is just gaga over her. She, not so much with him. She calls him Puss in Boots. Uh, she, play ga she plays games with him. Um, she's considered quite beautiful, quite just the uh, smashing woman. Um, so he is just completely in love with her. We have his, his love letters to her. He just goes on and on how much in love it with her he is and all the sexual things he wants to do with her quite graphically in his love letters. Her letters, mm, kind of cold, you know, not, she's not really into him so much. But she's basically going to be his reward given to him by this new government. In the end, he will get the girl that he wants. He will marry Josephine in 1796. And he'll get the command that he wants. The, com the directory is at war. And uh, the second coalition has begun, and um, he gets the command that he wants. They send him down to Italy, or the Italian front, what is called the Army of Italy, the army sent to invade Italy, or the Italian states. And it's he, this army's been kind of just sitting there for a few years, it is he who's going to plan this invasion of the northern Italian states. I've written northern Italy here, but really we need to call them the Italian states. There is no Italy at this point. They're just Italian states. And again, the French are going to come in there as liberators. This is really important. An army back then doesn't move very fast in according to the rules of war. But if you're liberating somebody, then the population will welcome you and give you all the food. So an army can move really fast, and he's going to move his army at lightning speed because he doesn't need to worry about bringing up supply trains. The supplies are going to be in Italy for him. And, and there will be some plunder. Um, Napoleon will become a millionaire as he moves into these northern Italian cities. He'll be plundering a lot of art and money for himself. He'll also be sending a lot back to the directory. A lot of it, northern Italian art will be heading for Paris. And where could we keep this art? Um, in a fortress, maybe. Uh, the Louvre in Paris was a fortress. Eventually, people will want to pay to see this art, and it'll become a museum. But um, this is what the French are doing. Napoleon's not the only one plundering. Lots of Frenchmen are plundering. In fact, again, let me remind you, the directory government is known for its corruption. Josephine, by the way, for keeping track of our love story here, uh, she will stay in Paris and continue her lifestyle. She does not expect Napoleon to live long. French generals don't live long. You have to lead from the front. And so Napoleon could be dead at any minute, and she'll need to move on to the next guy and collect his pension. So um, Napoleon at this time is very dashing. He's one of these young French generals. Again, there are lots of them. If you were a betting man, you know, he now enters the, the screen here as like, hey, here's a French general that is doing great things. But there were lots of French generals doing great things. But uh, he just does miraculous things. He's going to invade northern Italy from the west and move all the way across to the east, liberating all these Italian cities here, and then actually marching toward Vienna. And he'll get the Austrians to surrender. He will end that war by himself. Well, as we go into 1798, Napoleon's quite famous now. There's actually peace in Europe except for Britain. Britain is still at war with uh, revolutionary France. And the e French are always trying to come up with a way to defeat England. How do you do it? How do you beat an island? The French Navy is in disarray, so how do you get over to that island, or how do you defeat them? And one of the ideas is their trade. The English make money off of trade, and so if we could break up their trading system. And it's here that the French organize an expedition to Egypt, and Bonaparte is happy to go, happy to do something heroic. Egypt at this time was part of the Ottoman Empire, ruled over by Mamluks. So again, this will be liberation. As they go into Egypt, they will liberate Egypt for the Egyptians against the Mamluks. Bonaparte organizes a fleet, puts together 30,000 troops, and again, he handpicks his commanders. He'll also bring along, what makes Napoleon so great, is that he brings along a team of scientists and historians. They're called savants. Uh, that's the French word for a, a, an enlightened man, an educated, uh, elite, um, academic man. So scientists and historians will come along to study Egypt that they're liberating. And this becomes a romantic thing here, freeing the poor Egyptians from their, from their oppression, setting up a new government for them. Again, he set up governments for the Italians, he set up governments for the, governments for the Egyptians. Um, lots of stuff happens in Egypt. He gets to go see the Sphinx. He looks at the, uh, all these Egyptian things. They have a team of historians are studying them. They draw everything they see. And again, uh, they don't destroy anything. They're drawing and studying things. And then they happen to get the find of forever, the Rosetta Stone, which has the um, hieroglyphics, Greek and Demotic on it so that they can actually uncover the um, hieroglyphics. It still took them 20 years. With the answer right in front of you, it took them 20 years to crack 
uh, the hieroglyphic code. Bonaparte, um, while he was there in Egypt, actually got trapped there. His fleet got destroyed. He got trapped in Egypt and decided at one point to march on the Ottoman Empire and maybe, maybe even to India. Um, some historians view this as kind of the megalomania setting in here in his youth. Here he is at 32 years old wanting to conquer the world or wanting to be like Alexander the Great. Um, a little bit of that's true. You know, the, the megalomania is important here. He does think a lot of himself. And if you don't like Napoleon, he does something that um, you can always point to. He leaves his army in Egypt, goes back to France, and takes over the government. This is the coup of Brumaire, 1799. Napoleon left his army in Egypt, goes back to France, and participates in this coup. He didn't do everything. The planning was done within the government itself. Several of the directors resigned and then helped bring down the government. So... Um, this is how this coup worked out. The House of Ancients, one of the houses of the directory, will completely resign. And then um, the other house will give in. The president at this time was Lucien Bonaparte. One of Napoleon's brothers here actually took over the House of Peers, and Napoleon brought in the army. So this is how that coup took place, with Napoleon leading the army in to take over the government. What sort of new government do they have? Making up a new government. Um, it is called a republic. They will continue with a republic, and they will organize it and submit it to the people by plebiscite. The people actually get to vote. All the people, all the men of France get to vote on it, and they vote on it overwhelmingly, yes, because the other government was so terrible. It's called the consulate. This government that they come up with is a Roman-style government using consuls. The Romans had two consuls. The French will try three consuls, and they will rotate them, one, two, three, and they're supposed to rotate every year. There will be a senate that uh, has some power, kind of more of a Supreme Court, and then legislative body, which will only handle legislation given to them by the consuls. And this is the way that the government works from 1799 to 1804 as a consulate government. Bonaparte will volunteer to be the first consul, and he will not step down. He was supposed to rotate, but he does such a great job that they just say, hey, <laughs> you roll with it, you do it, and he'll do it for about four years here the consulate with Bonaparte as the first consul of this republic. He uh, does lead armies during this time, <laughs> and uh, this is the ideal painting here. Um, I showed you one of his other paintings of uh, Jacques-Louis Jacques David, the tennis court oath painting. Well, here he is painting Bonaparte crossing the Alps. This is the time of romanticism. This never actually happened, but it should have happened. A great man crossing the Alps to uh, rescue Italy. So from 1799 to 1804, this is the Bonaparte's greatest year. I don't care who you are, you have to say, well, he did great things here in these five years. Beethoven will write a sympathy, sim symphony for him. So great accomplishments in these five years, no one doubts that. He uh, will sit down with a team of lawyers and code all the new laws for France. This is great because it ends the violence of the terror. It ends the left-right hatreds there. He ends the corruption of the directory. His, his government will be based on merit. You have to prove yourself at every step. And then uh, healing the religion. There's that problem of the French Revolution, you know, chopping off heads of priests and atheism at one point. So he will contact the Pope. Again, Bonaparte is Italian. He considers himself Catholic. He respects the Catholic religion. Most Frenchmen are Catholics. And so he will contact the Pope and they will sign an agreement that France is a Catholic country. The majority of Frenchmen are Catholic, but the power of the Pope is nil in France. Everything that the Pope says must be okayed by the government first. This clearly places the state, the, 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 the church under the state. He will make peace with England. It's a brief peace, but he does contact the English and make peace with them. And he will reorganize the German states. It's at this point that we can start saying goodbye-bye to the Holy Roman Empire. Bonaparte has other plans. He will start conglomerating German states, tiny German states, into bigger German states. Um, this will end up biting France in the end. But it is a, a step forward for the Germans, trying to unite them together in a more enlightened form of government. And then um, when war with England was looming again, he will contact Thomas Jefferson, or Thomas Jefferson will contact him, and uh, they will agree to the sale of Louisiana. Um, this is done basically because Bonaparte cannot hold Louisiana, and it's a way of giving it to the Americans who can then get into animosity with the English over this, which they will. As you know, America will be going to war with England in 1812, the War of 1812. So Bonaparte plays a role in kind of giving America a gift, which helps stimulate hatred and a war between the United States and Britain later on. 